I can't get started without at least making a com comment on the debate last night. And um, I've heard mixed reviews on it. And um, I was upset <laughs> when I was watching the debate. But I had to uh, just settle my heart, to, and, and I did that uh, because of the scripture, because of the word. And um, I realized, you know, once again, this is uh, all going to be um, the Lord's call. And, uh, you know, we're not looking for man's approval or man's evaluation or what man thinks about anything, but we care about uh, what God says and what God's doing. And so when you just camp there for a minute, it settles your heart. And I thought of Psalm um, 75, 6 and 7, where it says there for exaltation or promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is the judge, and he puts down one and exalts another. And so, um, and so we can just uh, pray. So I encourage everybody to pray, pray, pray. Uh, I was also thought of the scripture, which really kind of um, gives us uh, the A, B, C, D factor of uh, prayer. It was in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Now, remember, this is God's response who changes not, responding to Solomon. And, um, and, and it says there, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locust to devour the land or send pestilence among my people... If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. And so I read that and thought, well, what is this place, the place of God's presence? And if you notice there in verse 4, I call it the ABCDs, the equation to successful prayer. It says, first humble yourself. And then it says, in that place of humility, you pray and you seek the Lord because you're praying, seeking the will of God, right? And then, so that's number three. Number four, you turn uh, from wicked ways. And so it speaks of repentance. And so... When you're in that place, God answers prayer. And um, if my people will pray like that, we'll be praying and God tells us he answers prayer. And so that is a, a promise. We know that God lifts up the humble. And um, James chapter 4 tells us that plainly. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you. Up. And so once again, humility is the key factor in that. And so, you know, the Bible tells us pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What are all these things? You know, those things that um, concern concern us. We're to seek the Lord and and he takes care of all those things, things that you have need of and the Lord tells us also that he knows what we have need of even before we ask. And so we have all this comfort coming from the scriptures. And so even though our emotional being can get caught up in the moment, uh, I was you know, listening to that. And of course, you know, I got caught up in the moment because just the, the 
frustration of hearing the lies and and all. And so it helped me when I when I sat in a place where I couldn't watch the TV. <laughs> that helped me a little bit. But bottom line is, is that's the world that we live in, and it's the end times, and we need to expect these things. Uh, but um, but it's going to be the Lord who directs us. But it's interesting because when the church prays, think about the variables of this life because we pray, if my people pray. So in other words, God changes things up by his people praying. And then also think about the fact that we're called to repentance. In other words, if even if daily, if necessary, we're to come with the Lord with the right heart. And so we need to come with a pure heart, clean heart for the Lord in humility, seeking his will, praying accordingly. And there's a dynamics and an equation where God answers prayer. So if my people, so today that would be if the church is praying, watch out. God will answer prayer. And so after all of that consideration, my heart was settled once again. And I'm so glad that I have God's word to go to to settle my heart. Because, you know, it is uh, ironclad promises of the Lord in in the midst of any situation. And I was encouraged more uh, concerning just considering the Apostle Paul and a lot of the apostles, what they went through. And how they were able to trust the Lord through it all and and God's people. And so I landed for the text tonight on Psalm 61. Now this is one of my favorite psalms. Psalm 61, along with, of course, Psalm 23, along with Psalm 27, along with Psalm 34, along with other psalms, you know. Uh, but Psalm 61 is at the top of the list of my favorite psalms. And so I landed here, and I want to go ahead and, um, you know, start by reading it through, uh, Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings, Selah. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life, his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever, O oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So I will sing praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. And Lord, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the comfort that it brings us. We know that we could call upon you and your present help in time of trouble. We know, Lord, that you give us eyes of understanding and hearts of discernment, and You're the one that does comfort us, Lord. And so we look to you. We pray that today, being 9-11, that you comfort all those families, Lord, who lost loved ones at this time, and that you would work through the believers, Lord, that have connection uh, with other families um, in that circle, Lord, and that you would minister there. And and also, Lord, uh, we pray for the state of our country and just ask once again that you would work mightily. Uh, keeping uh, President Trump safe during this time as he has a big target on him. And we just ask for your blessing. And as the church, Lord, we trust you. We look to you and we thank you that we can call upon you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 61, uh, the title of the message is um, Decision of Permanence making that decision of permanence. And, um, you know, looking to this psalm, you'll see that David uh, certainly did that as he would cry out to God. Um, When I was just um, out of high school, a friend and I, we wanted to join the Navy and be part of the SEALs team. That was our goal because at that time, they sort of dangled a carrot out there for guys like us 
who wanted a challenge like that. And the carrot was is that if you score a certain score on your physical and on your written and on your medical, and uh, that we would guarantee you a shot at the SEALs team. And so we bought into that. And so we went in and you know took the testing. And, um, and we qualified on all those tests until we got to the medical. And uh, I didn't qualify for the color vision. And so I was eliminated. And um, because you have to, in order to join, have a shot at the seals, you have to have perfect color vision. You're working underwater with explosives and colored wires and, and all of that. So I wonder why. But I remember learning that the SEALs during training uh, and during the difficult training that they had to endure, that they had at their disposal a bell. And any time they wanted out, no questions asked, all they had to do was go over and ring the bell. And if they rang the bell, they didn't have to do the training anymore, and they were just put into regular Navy. And, uh, and I thought, wow, how incredible it was because, uh, you know, of course, some rang the bell. But to have that temptation ever before you when you were going through the grueling, painful training, all you had to do was ring a bell and you were taken away from the pain that was before you. And, so, and, and, and it was extreme. They went through certain training that even some of them uh, nearly drowned and some drowned where they had to bring them back to life during the training. And so those who made it through, think about the, the um, strength of discipline that they had in order to carry on and the decision that they had to make to not give up. When um, I had opportunity to be part of a pastoral training school, they took 30, 30 uh, men and uh, uh, that's all that they would allow. And uh, the agreement was is that we would not stop our regular work schedule. We would, not, we would not stop our regular ministry schedule in order to do this two-year school into a one-year school. And so um, uh, 30 of us started, 18 of us finished. Uh, it was brutal. I mean, I would fall asleep at night, you know, with a, in, my face in a book and reading and studying. And, uh, and I just remember how, how brutal it was, you know, with the schedule that uh, we were all keeping. And so, but fortunately, you know, I made that decision of permanence. No matter what, no matter how much sleep deprivation and everything else, for one year I basically couldn't participate in any family things at all and um, made it through. And, uh, you know, um, it, was, it was brutal. You might, I could say the blessings were brutal that came from that. But uh, there was times that, you know, I wanted to quit, but I, I didn't quit. And, um, you know, as uh, I, was, I was thinking of those things as I was reading this psalm here, and, uh, and we had considered some of this on Sunday, remember, as we went through Psalm 57, uh, trusting in training. Because the idea is while we're in training, it's a time when you're learning, not knowing yet the particulars, the details of what God is trying to work out in you and through you. And so uh, sometimes you could say you're in the dark of all that God is doing. And, uh, but the important thing is, while trusting and training, is that you know Him. You don't have to know the details. It doesn't have to be easy. All you have to do is be anchored in the relationship with Him. And then you can endure because you know God never changes God has your best in mind. God is good when? Always. Always. God is good. And if you remember the Apostle Paul, with that particular subject in mind, he said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he said, For 
This reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And so here, no matter what he was going through, he, he says here, I also suffer. And so even in his suffering, he would not distrust God. He knew that the Lord was faithful and, um, and that he belonged to him. And he says, I'm not ashamed. In other words, as a believer, um, knowing God in that way, that whatever the Lord's choosing for you, not to be ashamed. Because I'm his. And, and, and so they would have to endure the most brutal of situations and he had that personal connection and that personal relationship with the Lord. And so Paul would agree that um, no matter the amount of suffering that God planned, that he was good with it. And um, also something to keep in mind with the temptation of the level of success that God might bring your way. Because you got temptation on both ends. Will the level of success distract you? Or will the level of trials distract you? It's something huge to keep in mind. Now, the Apostle Paul went on to say this in Philippians chapter 1. For I know... So, how does he know? For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body whether by life or by death, for to me is to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So Paul had given himself over to the Lord, making that decision of permanence to Jesus Christ, and that was it. There was no turning back, there was no giving up, there was no alternatives. And that is a man that cannot be stopped cannot be stopped, cannot be deterred. And he wasn't. And so here in Psalm 61, the psalm written by David. David, a man after God's own heart. David put into very difficult situations and came through some of those very successfully, very victoriously. Others he didn't. And here... He cries out to the Lord. He says, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. And so uh, basically he's saying, Lord, be aware. Uh, he's crying out. And we know God is. Sometimes, though, it seems that the Lord isn't hearing your prayer. And so... But what we see here is that vocalizing our prayer is important. And it's good, you know, to, to do that, um, to seek the Lord, to vocalize our thoughts, because God already hears them. But the Bible tells us that, that even though he already knows that, that we are to pray and we are to ask him it tells us in Matthew uh, chapter 6 verse 8 therefore do not be like them for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him and so notice he already the Bible's telling us he already knows what we have need of but the Bible's telling us to ask 
In other words, the Lord wants us vocalizing these things and talking to him about these things, I would say for our benefit. In Psalm 34, 4, uh, David writes, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. And so uh, by seeking, he sought the Lord and the Lord heard him. In other words, he sought him in prayer. He talked to him. He, he aired his concerns. He cried out to him uh, and asked it, that the Lord hear, attend to his prayer from the end of the earth. I will cry to you. So <laughs> no matter where you're out at, no matter how distant you may feel in, in your placement, from the end of the earth, I will cry to you. Uh, when my heart is overwhelmed, it's just a matter of time, unavoidable. Your heart, at some point, you serve the Lord, at some point. If you serve the Lord, you're on the front lines of the battle. You will get hit when your heart, or when my heart, he says, is overwhelmed. He's speaking about the most inner, his, his inner self. When you speak of heart, it speaks of a middle that's what the word is, middle, center. Um, the heart of the matter. You heard of that expression. He's expressing the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart, you might say. And the context is David is expressing the totality of his inner self. He's feeling overwhelmed, his very being. And it's the immaterial nature that he's expressing here. How, how do you put your finger on the heart of the matter? You're feeling it. You know, how do you explain it? It's, my, it's what I'm feeling. And somebody else goes through something, and they're not feeling the very thing that you're feeling, and they're going through the same thing. I don't know. Why does one thing hit one person so much harder, and, another, and the same thing doesn't hit somebody else as hard? I don't know. We're talking about something that's, immaterial it's in us our hearts vary in response and and sometimes it has to do with the history sometimes it has to do what we've gone through that somebody else hasn't gone through and it's why it hits us harder than it hits them you know we have memories that are brought up that reason it hits us and so we should never look at one another and say oh come on you know take some vitamins (laughs) i've heard i had that said to me one time when I was going through something very hard. But when that same person who said that to me was going through something as hard another time, I didn't return the statement. And so we have to be careful. And, and, you know, here is, uh, you know, can you imagine if, you know, where, if, if, if the Lord, if you will, responded insensitively to us, how sad that would be. He doesn't. You know, he cares, and so we are to care and to encourage one another and not think like, well, get over it, you know. Uh, he says that his heart is overwhelmed, and, and, so, uh, and so it's burdened is the idea, uh, overwhelmed, to, to be burdened. It means uh, carrying a load, to be burdened, and so we're not to be burdened um, without burdens, burdenless. We're just supposed to be burdened less. In other words, we turn our attention to the Lord, and uh, it tells us in Galatians 6 2 that we're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so. We have a responsibility to be available, open to helping others, which really brings upon ourselves burdens, but they're to be the burdens in Christ. In other words, not carrying them in our own energy, in our own strength, and not to be overburdened, but to be sacrificial, uh, not to try to escape things that are, would burden us. No, but we are to carry them in the strength that comes from the Lord, you have to be careful with the things that you take on, but you're to trust the Lord. And the Bible tells us that in Psalm 34, I think it is again, that many are the afflictions of the righteous. 
the bottom line is that we care so much that we just take upon ourselves these things because we care. But I would only say those things that you choose to take upon yourself should be bathed in prayer. And also uh, being discerning and and having wisdom. And sometimes it's hard to say no, but we need to say yes and no by the direction of the Lord. Because um, if the Lord has given you means, uh, you know, you have to pray how to use those resources to helping others and, and maybe saying no because the Lord has things that he's working out in somebody's life and so forth. And, um, and so being discerning, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And so uh, lead me from where I am, guide me is the idea. I don't understand what's going on. You know, help me, Lord. I don't get it. And so often we come to that place like, I don't know why this is happening, Lord. You need to lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That rock, of course, is Jesus Christ. You know, you need to lead me to a place where, uh, you know, I can understand. Help me with perspective, Lord. And it's always good, isn't it, to be on higher ground. You know, you need, you feel, if, if, if you're lost, Go to higher ground. You know, if you lose cell reception, go to the top of the mountain. You know how many times I've gotten cell reception? I've been hunting. Oh, no cell reception. And then all of a sudden, I left my phone on and my phone's in my pocket. And all of a sudden, I'm just hunting away. And I get to a high point, and all of a sudden, my phone goes off. I'm going, oh, I have reception here. So I pull it out and get all my updates. And then uh, as I'm walking, all of a sudden it goes away. And I'm right in the middle of the reading uh, text or something. So you know what I do? I have to return 10 feet back from where I just came from because that was the only place I could get the cell reception. The 10 feet over there, I didn't have it anymore. And so it's interesting because in the Lord, you know, we got to be careful not to lose that connection being in one place or being in another place. And so we say, Lord, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, so that I'm hearing from you, that I have the proper perspective, even if I don't understand the details of what's going on, and I'm on that learning curve, to trust in you for what is going on. And so and so uh, it says there, uh, lead me to the rock, not a rock. But the rock, and that would um, be the place where we gain footing, standing upon the Lord Jesus Christ in application. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. And so you notice something that there's a history. There's a history that's rock solid in David's life. And that's why he's able to say, you have been that shelter. I'm calling upon God who has been faithful in my life. And David knows very well. And it tells us in Psalm 127.1, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And so, um, unless God has got it, then we're in trouble. Unless it's God who's doing it, we're in trouble. It's God who builds this relationship otherwise it's a worthless endeavor it's in vain if it's just us that's doing it but when it's the lord that's doing it then uh then we can say with david that you are a my strong tower from the enemy so when the enemy attacks we rely upon the lord uh, who is that uh, strong tower verse four i will abide 
in your tabernacle forever. That tabernacle points to when you're before the presence of God. They went into the tabernacle, and that's where God's Shekinah glory was, in the presence of the Lord in his tabernacle. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. And so that's the kind of perspective he has. I will trust in the shelter of your wings, say law. And so David makes a statement that follows with the history that he has where he says, I will trust. In other words, he's predetermined, although right now I'm overwhelmed. My heart is overwhelmed, but I will trust in you. Not knowing what's next, still God, I know you are unchanging God. We have a history. You're faithful. I'm overwhelmed, but I will trust in you. You are my rock. So he says to ponder that, Selah. And there, this is a proclamation of David. And I would only say, make it yours. Ponder this proclamation that David says, I will trust in the shelter of your wings. And so all of us have a history. God is faithful. I have a history of God's faithfulness that I draw from regularly, if not daily, this history. And I thank the Lord for it. And when I pondered, Selah, when I pondered that, and I was on the theme, of course, that God is my shelter, and shelter means that God as my hope, God as my refuge, in God be my trust. That's the idea of shelter. And um, I thought of a particular um, experience that I had, like I said, one of many that I draw from. And uh, when I was just a year out of high school, I had just um, recovered from a serious traffic accident where um, my cousin, who was driving, ended up um, uh, paraplegic, you know, to this day, can't talk. And he was driving, and the car that hit us uh, hit where I was sitting. And uh, it was a 64 Impala, and a 59 Cadillac hit us. So that's all a lot of steel. And when you look at the car, you can see where the door wrapped around me. I watched the accident, so my head went through the, the side window. And uh, like I said, the Lord delivered me from that. The doctor said I would never have 20-20 vision again. And, um, and three days later, my, my dad had said when he saw me in the hospital, he didn't recognize me. That's how bad I looked. But three days later... My face peeled like a mask, and I had 20-20 vision. So the Lord delivered me from that. And it was just after that that I went on a three-month hitchhiking adventure across the United States. I was a California-raised California boy. didn't know anything about ice and, or cold. I left my house in January to head back to across the United States that I didn't even have a jacket. I borrowed my, my friend's down jacket, but I didn't own a jacket. So long story short, the part I want to get to is that we were going across Kansas. And we didn't have a defroster. And my friends were sleeping in their sleeping bag. We didn't have a heater. Uh, this, the, the temperatures dropped to 30 below zero with the wind chill factor. And so we're driving in a little Vega <laughs> with California bald tires. I can't tell you all that happens, but I will tell you that at about one in the morning, we were in trouble on a 
road that never ended, straight road in, in Kansas. And I, and I wish I had time to tell you what happened, other things that happened that were funny. But we were in trouble. And I said, Lord, help. No sooner, my friends are in their sleeping bags. My friends are unbelievers. I was a Christian. So I said, Lord, help. We're in trouble. This is severe. And then I see a sign right after I prayed. Storm shelter ahead. We're caught in the storm. Storm shelter ahead. You ever seen a sign like that? Probably never. Little sto- little sign says, storm. Lord, help. Storm shelter ahead. So we pull over. I wake up my friends. We, there's this cabin. We got out of this vega into this, into this storm. We went into the cabin, and right outside the cabin was a full um, uh, wood, dry wood, and a huge fireplace. So we started this fire in the storm shelter that we burned all night long. My friend's back in their sleeping bag. I stoked the fire all night long. My food was Hershey bars. I stoked the fire all night long. So in the morning, the storm had passed, but it was 30 below zero with the chill factor. We went outside, and this vega was encased in white. Could barely get the doors open, and when I got in, turned the key, and there was nothing. So I said to my friends, who were also in the car, let's pray. And I prayed, turned that key, and it started up like it was warm. And we drove to a gas station that was you know, now it's daytime. We drove to a gas station and we got gas. We were about out of gas. That was the other thing I didn't add. Lord, we're in trouble. We're out of gas. There's no gas station. It's the middle of the night. Lord, help. Storm shelter ahead. So we prayed. The Lord started the car just like it was warm, drove to the gas station, got gas. On that trip, several times, We were in trouble with ice slipping off the road, ending up into a field. And I'd say, let's pray. And we'd say, we'd pray. Somebody would stop with a winch, pull us back onto the road, and we're gone again. And then we'd slip off the road somewhere else. It was the scariest thing ever. Well, this happened three or four times. Then finally, one of my friends said, let's pray, (laughs) you know. (laughs) And so they weren't believers when we started that trip, and hoping after all of that they became believers. But the word says, "I will trust in the I will trust in the shelter of your wings." And so, no matter where you're at, when you call upon the Lord, you can trust the Lord. The language uh, next in these next verses is past tense, as if David is stating this is a done deal. And now he's just waiting for the Lord to come through. And so David, uh, his faith is active. His faith is apparent. His faith is expressed despite his emotion, despite his humanity, despite feeling overwhelmed. And he says there in verse 5, For you, O God, have heard my vows You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life, his years, his many generations. You shall abide uh, before God for he shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. And so once again, God, you have done these things already. These things are in concrete. Now I'm just waiting for the fulfillment of these things. And so what he's doing is he's applying principle. Once again, just like David did many times before, as we talked about on Sunday, he applied the principle of being uh, delivered from the bear, being delivered from the lion. I will be delivered from this giant, this Goliath. Because a lion and a bear was every bit as dangerous as this Goliath was and God delivered him so the the Goliath in David's perspective wasn't giant because God was giant in his perspective and that's what we need to keep track of 
that uh, you have given me. This is, you know, you have promised to take care of me. It's like us. We know that the Lord's going to come back. We know that as bad as things may get, that the Lord is going to deliver us. It's a matter of time. He's promised to come back and get us. The Bible says he'll never leave us or forsake us and that he will take care of us. And so these are promises. And so we need to implement because of the history of his faithfulness in our lives. We need to implement this in faith, despite our emotional being, despite our humanity that might contradict what we know to be true because we know him. And so we draw from that faithful relationship and then that's how we're comforted and he shall abide before God forever. So forever, once again, a God only concept. Eternity is only made real by the eternal God. There is no rationale for eternity without God, the eternal God, being considered. There is no rationale for it at all. And so we have the promise of eternity, and he says, Oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. So here he's saying basically mercy and truth are the guardians to these things. First of all, he knows God's merciful, and then he knows God's true. They are his guardians in his dilemma in his struggle, in the threats against him. They are his guardians, and they will preserve him. It means to guard him, preserve, to guard, uh, to keep him safe as a blockade and as a watchman. So let mercy and truth be the watchman over my life. It's not me, it's not my ideas but it's mercy and truth the mercy and truth of God so then this last verse eight so I will sing praise to your name forever that I may daily perform my vows and so not a half-hearted or not a short-term commitment but that will never cut it so, so that I might daily do the things that the Lord's called me to do, I have an eternal perspective. And that's why, and, and Paul would say it, that what I'm dealing with is a light affliction when you consider the benefits of the eternal reward. And so whatever I have to deal with, that's light. This is small. And so when God in, in eternity is in our perspective, then that's how we daily perform the things that God calls us to. And each and every day choosing to trust God who is faithful in the race that is set before us. I will finish well. I will look forward to hearing, enter in, thou good and faithful servant, to the joy of the Lord. So I look forward to that. We know that Jesus, who never quit, is our example example in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, enduring the cross, setting the example for all of us, the Bible tells us that we are to take up our cross daily. What does that mean? I'm not to take up your cross daily. I'm to take up my cross daily. In other words, in the whole working things out in our lives, the Lord has given us a responsibility. Daily we say, Lord, give me the strength to take up the cross you've given me to bear. And in that, he's also going to give you the strength to bear it. And so Jesus commanded us to follow him. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So how do you fulfill that? You follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as he makes his will known and his commandment known to our hearts, then despite our humanity, which can you feel like sometimes it's unraveling. It gets it gets so 
you know, whether it be emotional, fearful, you know, we're not supposed to be completely without fear and, and you know, because although faith is, is contrary to many of the things we struggle with, we're going to still struggle because the Bible clearly tells us that that's going to happen. We're going to struggle. We see it in all the great men of faith, so we know we're going to see it in our own lives, but we need to cry out to the Lord and then ask him for deliverance, and he will meet you there, and will deliver you, and will give you the faith to trust in him. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Psalms. We just thank you, Lord, just uh, for encouraging our hearts, and especially at a time right now when we're looking at the world uh, being just total chaos, nothing that we've ever even seen, nothing I've even ever heard of for the United States of America uh, since its beginnings, but we see it now. Um, and Lord, we just ask that we would be those that would keep our eye upon you. We ask, Lord, for deliverance. And we ask, God, uh, that your will be accomplished not only in this nation, but in our hearts and in the church. So help us to make a difference in the lives of those that we get to touch the, that cross our path, Lord. You know, we're, we're called to be faithful with the little. And uh, so help us to do that. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.